Hello everyone and welcome to another fully live episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey, I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today we have a very special guest on, my fellow security researcher focusing on hardware and Wi-Fi, Stefan Krebser. Stefan, thank you for joining us today, although your fans may know you as Space Coon. Yes. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Cool, so today we are going to do our weekly roundup of interesting InfoSec topics, some things that you might want to know if you're a hacker in terms of software worth checking out, and also some really cool features that people are already using in a number of creative ways that have come to browsers recently. Unfortunately, not all browsers, but uh, I think Edge and uh, Chrome are the two ones that it is currently working on. Uh, we'll go over how Adafruit and also how Stefan are both using some of these really cool new features such as the web serial a little bit later on in the show. And if you're joining us today and you have any questions or anything during the show, we are again fully live, so we'll be able to see your chat. Uh, so it's great to see Zam here, 8 bit Oni, and of course, everyone else we uh, have on the stream today. So uh, to get started, a little bit of a fun story, I guess. We've been kind of checking in on how I'm doing personally at crashing this drone that uh, the company gave me earlier this year. So uh, since we've started, I've so far strafed a tree at 35 miles per hour, and then I have hit a bridge 12 times in a row after losing signal underneath a steel bridge above rushing water. This did not kill the drone. So I decided, hey, let's try something a little bit more. I tried flying it apparently almost directly into a military attack helicopter. I tried flying it uh, into a rainstorm above a lake. None of this really did anything until finally uh, it just threw a prop. It just threw a propeller for absolutely no reason while above a waterfall and then attempted to come back home again over a lake while critically wounded for a little drone and not able to fly normally. So if we switch to my screen, um, last weekend I was treated to a really fun hike where I basically had to study this whirling footage over and over in order to determine where my drone had fallen. Um, this resulted in over an hour long hike and search and that rescue operation. But thankfully, uh, due to the power of OSINT and the fact that we have a friend who's just really good at uh, interpreting maps, we were able to find the general location where this was far after the battery died. So if you're ever in a situation where you're flying a drone and you lose it and it's a modern drone, this is kind of what happens. Um, it doesn't go into some special locator low power mode that allows you to have some time to get over to where it is. If you're on like 29% battery, it's gonna keep streaming 1080p uh, video to your phone for no reason of its crash site. And uh, it'll beep and stuff for maybe like 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 minutes. So if it were say on the far side of a lake that's impassable and very difficult to get to, this would uh, become a problem. I think actually my screen might've already frozen, which isn't a good sign for, uh, for the stream, but um, I guess we'll see if I try to switch to another tab. Uh, so anyway, uh, I have still, for the record, failed to kill this drone. We were able to recover it. And um, after a little bit of trouble, we did manage to get the prop put back on. So uh, I'm pretty impressed for, you know, a, a little drone that fits in the palm of my hand. The fact that it has now survived what I would consider it to be two unsurvivable crashes is, uh, yeah, pretty impressive. So still have not killed this drone. Um, crashing it into the middle of remote terrain uh, is apparently not enough to do it in. So yeah, sorry guys, I will keep trying. I feel bad every time I come back to you guys with a non-crash drone after one of these accidents, but you know, we'll get there. So all right. honestly, at, at this point, at this point, you could make like a drone review or yeah. something. <laughs> like, get paid for this because this seems indestructible. It really does, and I think that my individual drone just might be haunted or something because, um, frankly, I've seen a lot of other people with the exact same drone lose it for doing way less serious things. Um, in particular, I saw somebody crash their drone into a bridge. Uh, very lightly, they just kind of tapped it and it fell directly into the water and did not recover. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe you know, it's got a mind of its own. All right, um, if we switch back to my screen, I guess we'll find out pretty quickly if it's frozen. Yep, okay, it's still frozen. So, Stefan, why don't we take this fun opportunity to uh, tease a little bit about the um, 
the thing that you and I have been collaborating on that is an upgrade for the D1 Mini, which I have one of right here. So if you don't know what this is, then this is a small uh, microcontroller that's in ESP8266 put on a development board that's super, super cheap and easy to find. You can find it on Amazon, you can find it on AliExpress, and if you buy a whole bunch of them, they can be really cheap, like $3 or less. So um, we have a number of different projects we've collaborated on together using these really easy to find boards. And one of them that we've been talking about and, and kind of working on for the last couple of weeks, I think is really cool and simple. And we, I, I guess, are uh, open to some feedback on it if you're someone who might use something like this. Stefan? Yeah, so um, if you look at my screen, this is a render. I just ordered the PCBs. Um, so yeah, this is what we're working on, a, uh, a little board. Uh, on the back side, you would have the uh, D1 Mini that Cody just showed. And on the front, you have a little OLED display, a NeoPixel RGB LED, and six buttons. And it's basically uh, like a Game Boy or handheld-like um, layout. So the cool thing about this is it's super easy to uh, build yourself because you only need yeah that D1 Mini, which is like $3, and OLED is like $3. And then these buttons are fairly common. You can get them anywhere. They're just a few cents and a single NeoPixel LED. And you can sort this together very easily. And you can run the D offer on this. Now, I don't have physical hardware to show you yet because this is very fresh. This is like a super early preview here. Um, but I think this, this could be big because we could not only use this for the um, ESP8266 D offer. Um, but also for other projects. Um, you could put your own software on this, doesn't really matter what you're running. Um, I mean, it has buttons and an OLED, you could, you could program your own games with it. Um, yeah, it's very, very hacker friendly, very cheap, um, very DIY, um, great for maybe conferences or something as well if we're doing workshops. So yeah, I think this, this might be cool. I also plan to maybe 3D design a case, um, stuff like that, yeah. And awesome. I hope Cody well, was, um, is somewhere uh, oh, in this call because I don't sorry. see or I, hear uh, him. OBS is being a little bit weird. Hopefully um, you can but still yeah, this hear is, me okay. This is pretty much uh, what, we've been, what we've been working on. I, there are plenty of ideas I already have of upgrading this. Um, but yeah, this is the, the earliest preview or the, the most we can show you at this point, I, I guess. Oh, you were there for a second and now he's, he's gone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Sorry, so if you uh, have feedback or Sivan ideas, I leave them in the chat, I suppose, because uh, my screen froze, so uh, that is a lot of fun, yeah. and our, if, web, if you our have network is very slow, so, oops. With this, I think this, this might be a big upgrade to the DOFA project as well, because right now, if you want to build your own um, OLED-based DOFA, you have to um, put it on a breadboard, wait, I have something here, it looks, it looks crazy, okay, okay, don't use these jumper wires they're insane but uh use shorter ones but uh still you, you you gotta have to build something like this and this pcb could make that a lot easier and a lot nicer cody did you manage to get back i feel like i have thank you for um taking over can you hear me okay yes oh my gosh all right yeah so i was like oh i'll just restart obs and then for the last like two minutes i've been white knuckling just waiting for the page to slowly reload but i think it's actually back but yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for showing that off. I've I've really been excited about this because there's only a couple other projects that allow you to use um, you know the the text based features of the D author without having to use a, a computer interface or some or a smartphone uh, via the web interface or something. And I think it's so cool that you can just like get started with this very very quickly. I have the components just lying around to make one of these, so it's very easy to find them. And you're not relying on a lot of things that are like, again, difficult to find or difficult to assemble. With the exception of the NeoPixel, I think these are all like through hole soldering uh, things, right? So if we were doing yes. a class on this, it would be pretty easy for someone who'd even never soldered before to do this and not mess up anything up. Yeah, and the nice thing is even the NeoPixel is pretty big uh, and easy to solder. I even made the um, pads a bit bigger, so it's easier. And even if you don't manage it or if you can't get a NeoPixel or something, it doesn't really matter because the whole thing will work without it too. It's just like an extra to have that RGB LED. Yeah, so this is an attempt to create something that's really simple that anybody can put together. And if you wanted to just get your own PCB and slap these parts together, you could create one of these very, very easily. Uh, but if there's something that you guys feel like this is missing, like, I don't know, like a laser maybe or something. <laughs> oh, God, <sorry>. no. <laughs> 
or some other, sorry, some other more relevant core feature that you feel like would make this a little bit better that wouldn't add like some, like for example, I was like, hey, we should make this have a LiPo battery so that you can make this more portable. And Stefan pointed out that, hey, there's already hats that fit on the back of the uh, D1 Mini that you can just attach to the back of this. And while it makes it a little bit thicker, it also allows you to have a battery right underneath. And it's a pretty compact, pretty cool design. So you can expand this in different ways with uh, different hats or ex uh, extended uh, PCBs that are designed to fit on top of the D1 Mini. Um, you can just put that behind the D1 Mini that's soldered onto the back of this and make something that maybe is able to be charged by a battery or otherwise uh, has some additional ability. So if you wish that this had more features, it's often just a matter of adding you know, another, another module to the back of it if that's what you wanted to do. So uh, if you feel like this is missing something critical that's not a battery, because Stefan and I have already thought about this for like an hour and I feel like we can't make any more progress. Oh, yeah. yeah um, <laughs> but if you feel like this is missing anything besides like a battery, then uh, please let us know because we're still in the early phases of development. We want to make this useful for the community. And if there's any like killer feature that this really could have with like a single extra piece of hardware, you know, we would love to hear about it because uh, this is the new design and um, yeah, we want some feedback. So uh, thank you guys for joining us on the stream because you get to uh, maybe hear about some of these projects before they officially are announced. And uh, yeah, it's nice to tease these projects and get a little bit of feedback. So. Hopefully you guys like that, and hopefully you'll enjoy this project when it does come out. We're thinking about making it uh, something like a workshop project where, you know, if I'm doing a conference or something and I get to do a beginner Wi-Fi hacking workshop, maybe you get to put together your own device and keep it at the end of it after you learn how to use it during the class. It seems like a lot more fun than just like learning stuff online. So. I already see someone commented, um, I think it needs an enclosure, and uh, I completely agree. So I will be working on 3D printing a case as soon as I get my hands on the real PCBs that I uh, ordered. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. So hopefully, yeah, there will be an enclosure that's 3D printable. And if you want to just buy one of these in the future from Safan, I'm sure that he'll be able to just snap them together uh, and pre-program them and have them looking really nice. Or if you want to just build your own, you can either do that completely by yourself or, you know, you can buy a kit from Stefan and support the community and, uh, you know, we appreciate stuff like that. But the, de the design is completely open source, which is beautiful really? and wonderful. Huh? Will be. Will yeah, be. So yeah. um, this this won't be the last time you hear of this uh, in this live stream too. I I would I would bet on that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So yeah, um, an enclosure is on its way. So sometime in the future when this is out and ready, then uh, you can look forward to that. Um, all right, shall we go into the new stuff today? Or actually, like maybe before we do that, we should talk a little bit about some of the software serial features and why that's so cool because it still blows my mind and I don't think many people really know about this yet. So it would be great to uh, to tell people why this is such a game changer for teaching people about like microcontrollers. Um, yeah, you are talking about the web serial API. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, it's an, it's an API for browsers or for just the whole web stack, I suppose. Um, so browsers can access serial ports on your computer. Um, it's uh maybe you've heard of web usb already uh web serial is like that but just sp yeah specific for serial connections so uh if i was to develop a website that wants to connect to a serial port um for example of an arduino board um then i could do that now very very easily and i have the page open here um the only problem is browser compatibility ah. as you can see only Chrome and Edge, and I, I guess Chromium should work too, um, and only on desktop uh, currently support this. So it's still new, um, but we already know of other websites that make use of this feature, and that's just fantastic. Uh, one example is the Adafruit ESP tool, and maybe you've heard of the ESP tool uh, bef uh, already. This is um, basically you use this to flash um, yeah, ESP chips like the ESP8266 or ESP32. And now you can do that in the browser. Like you don't have to install anything. You don't have to run Python and it's missing the path. And where's the bin file? You know, you don't have to care about this because there's a website now. The only problem is you need Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this. Yeah. This totally blows my mind because like, let's compare these two processes right now. Like for, for most people, let's say that you have one of these ESP8266 based devices, like a D1 mini or like a, 
Oh, Adafruit Feather? Uh, or which ones actually use ESP266? I'm not as familiar with their boards. Uh, there is a Feather with an ESP8266. Feather is just like the family of boards. Oh, right. So like a Feather Wing or whatever. Uh, yeah, Feather Huzzah or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or like a Node MCU or, or any, like, um, any one of these development boards. You would have to first plug it into your computer, and then sometimes, depending on the type, you'll need to install a driver um, so that it can actually see that. So that's thing number one. Then after that, you will need to like install a program or install Arduino, open it up, add this board, start programming it, send something to it, and then, OK, in order to communicate with that, you can either use the built-in serial terminal in Arduino, which honestly kind of sucks, or you need to use something like Screen or the Hunator, which is a Rust program you can install to communicate with this board through a serial terminal. Most people are not comfortable with serial terminals. A lot of people aren't even aware their computer has a serial ter or like a, a, a like a terminal uh, that they can use to connect to this. So uh, it's kind of an uphill battle because with all those steps, it's very likely that somebody has a problem. Maybe it's installed. Arduino, maybe it's installing ESP tool via the command line if Arduino isn't working for some reason. Um, so we are throwing all that away and changing it with like, all right, you plug it in, and then presuming you know you don't need to download a driver to see it, you should be able to just go to a website, flash the device through the website, and then access the device through the website as well. So everything you you do could be hosted on a, a local website or an external website that allows you to download the the newest firmware onto the device and then you know guides you through connecting to it and doing stuff on it um, that to me is really exciting because if i wanted to create and i kind of do want to create now like some sort of like learning hub where while you're learning cybersecurity you can have the same couple of devices be flashed to you know emulate an attacker device or emulate an ftp server and learn how to attack it and how they're vulnerable like these sorts of things would allow you to have a single device be changed and and kind of updated to be whatever like the lesson suits or or really whatever you want to do and i think it's cool that People don't need to have as much computer science background or computer science experience in order to connect to one of these microcontroller devices and start using it. Because uh, for a while, it was like Raspberry Pis were like really like on the edge and like kind of hard to use. And then they kind of got easy to use. And now these microcontrollers are kind of like on the edge and like kind of hard to use because you have to program them. But it's getting to the point that they're not anymore, where if you can just do this through the browser, anybody can get started You know, plugging this in, flashing firmware to it, and then using it, provided that whole process happens in a browser and makes it super user friendly. So I'm really excited because I think this will open up the ability to be more flexible with these boards and try out new projects um, from people who you know don't want to spend 20 minutes figuring out the poor documentation on GitHub uh, in order to try out like a new project on one of these little microcontrollers. Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of problems um, because people uh, always need to install some kind of serial terminal yes. and then something goes wrong because their platform isn't supported, the packet manager doesn't find the packet, or I don't know, a dependency can't be installed, or a Python path is not able to be found anywhere. And it's just annoying. And then figuring out the right serial port, it's, it's all... Um, I'm not saying it's hard, it's not, but it's um, it's very off-putting for anyone that just wants to get started. Uh, it's like all these extra layers and steps, um, and a website would make this so much easier. And the way this works uh, from a user's perspective is you um, select the serial port, like you would select uh, a camera uh, or a microphone if you join like a web-based uh, conference call. It's like the same pop-up that opens, but instead of selecting a camera, you can select the serial port. And if you uh, unplug and uh, replug the device, you can actually see the uh, port pop up in the list, which is also super useful because it makes so much makes it so much easier for people to figure out the port they actually need to use. Because that's also a very common beginner problem that people don't even know if their, for example, their driver is installed because they don't know if the serial ports they're seeing in the list. Uh, resemble the devices that are actually connected because sometimes you see you see reports, but they are some internal computer stuff, but not the board you're trying to flash. Yeah, you have to like unplug it and plug it back in and like run the command over and over to like find out which is which. It, it gets confusing for beginners. And from from teaching this to people as well, I have some once at a hacker conference, like I can definitely say that there's about 15 different things that can go wrong. 
all of which look yeah. kind of similar, and the root cause is different from for every single one. So just trying to diagnose this for beginners, it can be a little bit discouraging. I'm not saying it's impossible. I think we've made it relatively easy to get started with programs like the Dauthor, but it just blows my mind how much easier it's going to be when we can do all this stuff through a web interface and just be like, all right, just go to the website, plug it in, and press this button, and you'll have the latest, most updated version of this uh, thing. You know, that's not easy to do. So uh, we're really excited because even the uh, the Hunator didn't have the ability to update the firmware on uh, Stefan's Dauthor project. So if through like a web interface you were able to do that in the future, that would be a huge leap forward beyond even what we're currently capable of doing through a terminal. So I think that's great. It's yes. really, really cool. And Adafruit's kind of leading the way on this. So, um, you know, I know Stefan would love to work with Adafruit someday. So uh, if anybody from Adafruit's on the stream or sees the stream, you know, the, we'd love to collaborate with you on something like that because uh, I've just been very impressed by the way Adafruit's using this to make their product that much easier and that much better. A lot of the ideas I've had for how to use this have been basically what Stefan's been showing me that Adafruit's been doing. So uh, yeah, very, very impressed by Adafruit's work on this and hopefully they continue making uh, some really uh, useful ways of people to connect to their products. All right. Should we get into some news? Yes. Yes, let's do it. All right. So one thing I wanted to point out, um, I like to try to point out tools that I think are interesting, useful, or cool. Uh, a lot of them I haven't used yet. But uh, since on the show, we're constantly looking at new tools to use, I like to give a little shout out to things I think are interesting. And one thing that I think uh, is pretty cool, if you want to switch to my screen, uh, is Email Finder. So I'm constantly looking for email addresses from specific domains. And this is a really, really easy way to just immediately scrape a bunch of different emails from that domain by going through lots of web results and trying to find uh, like a string that matches an email address. Now, the thing I like about this project is um, you, know, you can install it with a pip3 install email finder. It's really, really easy. The documentation on this is good. And it meets all of my basic health uh, requirements of, you know, it's got a good amount of stars and it was updated last month. Like, yeah, I feel like this is going to work. Um, one thing I will say, though, is for journalists or anybody else that might be using this, um, you will definitely find fake email addresses using the technique of scraping emails from search results. And that's because People will use throwaway fake email addresses while signing up for forms that aren't validated. People will will do all sorts of things that, uh, you know, especially for something like at thewhitehouse.gov. If you do a search for email addresses at the white at thewhitehouse.gov and are doing it on, you know, Google or Bing results, you're going to get everybody who's made up an like an offensive email address at thewhitehouse.gov as their like fake email and there are lots of them. So like I will do this for journalists sometimes and they'll look at the results and be like, whoa, like that's so controversial that the White House would have that email just I'm like, no. Some like <laughs> some like libertarian on a forum somewhere like made that up as their like username or whatever. And like now because we're just scraping anything it finds, you know, it's just gonna put it in the list. So like you still need to go through the additional step of verification when you use a tool like this. I, I feel like that's important to point out. But if you don't have you know, email addresses to try to verify the first place, it's not very useful. So you do need tools like this to kind of fill up the funnel and then like go through everything and find the, the real email addresses inside what this will find. But uh, yeah, I found this to be a pretty useful tool that, um, you know, well, like just gives people a place to start when they are doing a search for email addresses at a specific company. <laughs> someone at Microsoft.com. Sure, I guess if you just got to talk to someone and you don't care who it is, then this is the email address to use. Um, so yeah, I uh, I like this a lot, and uh, that's my one tool. Unfortunately, this week I haven't. I don't really have any others to feature this week. But that's my one tool I'm giving a shout out to that I thought was pretty useful, um, especially since I'm doing a lot of OSINT stuff. Um, all right, so now let's actually get into the news. Um, one thing that popped up on my Twitter feed and I thought was uh, noteworthy was the uh, kind of ancient update to Apple devices. This was addressing. Uh, iOS devices are, are just really old devices that have been outside of the general update cycle for quite some time. But when Apple apparently sees this sort of exploit in the wild, uh, they actually will take action. Uh, and that's exactly what the case was here. Apparently, there were reports of these devices being exploited in the wild. So Apple decided, like, all right, well, we can't just shut these devices down. Uh, and uh, let's see. So processing a maliciously crafted certificate may lead to arbitrary code execution. That's not good. And then the same thing here. Um, Apple's also aware of report that this has been actively exploited. 
and then this one is being actively exported too. So there's, these are both issues with WebKit, and they are both actively exported issues with WebKit. So this is something that you would typically find like one of these companies that resells exploits that are targeting old devices, packaging them into things like spyware or stalkerware, where people will do everything from using this in uh, countries where maybe there's a lot of older phones and not as many laws about cybersecurity, like maybe, I don't know, somewhere in the Middle East, um, and then use it to target journalists or political opponents or other people that might be using an older iOS device. Um, you know, or you might find this in cases where people are just stalking their spouse and are paying to just try to install malware on the phone to make it trackable. Like these are both the kind of activities that are associated with these sorts of old exploits because, you know, like these are devices that are not the newest devices. They may not be the biggest target for, you know, uh, like most people that are going after things that are included in the current update cycle, but because they're old and because they're forgotten about, that makes them particularly vulnerable to these sorts of abuse from commercialized entities that are trying to find some way of marketing effectively these old exploits for devices that are still out there being used by people um, who I guess have enemies of some sort. So uh, yeah, just another impact of uh, cybersecurity on real world people. You know, we don't know who was being actively exploited by this, but we know that someone with older iPhones was definitely um, being taken advantage of by this sort of issue. So yeah, just kind of speculation on like what sort of entity was using this. But again, I see the sort of thing all the time where an exploit no longer is relevant for current phones. So it kind of gets kicked back to this weird gray market where in certain countries you can just buy the software to put on your spouse's phone or something like that. and. It's very sketchy and not very moral. Anything to say about that, Stefan? How do you feel about that? Old iPhones getting it, huh? Yeah, I don't have an old iPhone, so I'm not emotionally attached to this, but our arbitrary code execution sounds really bad. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's good. it's good that they fix it, I suppose. All right, so let's go ahead and switch over. Um, and there has been some malware that has been actively infecting computers that are downloading, uh, let's just say, free versions of commercial software. So if you're, I guess I'll say it, pirating software, uh, you might be at risk for somebody backdooring whatever software it is you are installing. And I'm sure this is a way I have uh, ruined multiple computers in the past by causing them to be infected. Uh, and you know, it's a pretty common attack vector. Like if you know there's a piece of software that everybody wants and you're able to it actually doesn't even need to work, provided you're able to put up a torrent that looks like um, it's been downloaded by other people and might might give you this program. A lot of them are actually backdoored with this sort of virus. So you're like, all right, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, apparently um, a bunch of, I guess, three million Windows-based computers um, were infected with uh, this particular type of malware, which then ransacked through it, f went through all their files, and did everything from taking screenshots of webcam sessions to just taking screenshots of the entire computer screen and sending it off to a remote server, which is now 1.2 terabytes of private data on all these random people that happened to be infected. So this was kind of like just a smash and grab and that you know, these computers were infected and then the, the operator just wanted to see as much information as possible. And it seems that, oh, uh, it was uh, Adobe Photoshop 2018, a Windows cracking tool and a couple of games. Was it worth it, you guys? I hope it was worth uh, it. Yeah, yeah. The, so many people crack the Adobe software because it's just, it's just too expensive. And honestly, I, okay, no, I don't want to rant about Adobe here. It takes too much time. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I mean, I know people that have done that, and um, these cracking software is super sketchy. And I always thought this this probably has a backdoor because like you run an executable, and sometimes obviously the like Windows Defender or whatever antivirus uh, that's that's going to give you a big warning. And you're like, yes, 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 I want to run this anyway. Because obviously you need it to um, access the, the software that you're trying to crack. I... And yeah, so I guess if you do something like that, you have an easy game installing malware on people's computers, especially with Adobe software, because a lot of them people <laughs> crack that. Definitely, definitely. So let's talk about um, the actual stuff that was stolen. So uh, we had apparently 26 million login credentials. Um, emails or usernames wow. accompanied by a password uh, from almost a million different websites. So looking into these groups, we've got social media, online gaming, online marketplace, job search websites, file storage and gaming uh, and sharing, 
Uh, consumer Electronics, Community, Financial, what, look, PayPal. Oh, I love this breakdown, by the way. I have to say, like, good on you, Nordlocker, for, like, putting this together in such a digestible format. But PayPal, Quickie, Blockchain, um, Coinbase. That's a bummer, you guys. 13,000 13, 13, 13, people had their Coinbase credentials breached. Like, dumb. That sucks. Um, and then what's miscellaneous? Do I even want to know? Yandex. Oh, no. GitHub. Oh, well, that's a problem. 19,000 <laughs> oh, GitHub accounts uh, compromised. So this is just a massive amount of data. It's just so much. And then the type of files, primarily text files. OK, also some images and documents. All right. Um, Wow, man, this is a lot. They stole 696 PD, uh, six, sorry, I should say this properly, 696,000 nice uh, PNGs files just off of these uh, various things. But do you know about the marketplace in selling cookies, Stefan? Or have you heard uh, about that? Uh, no, wait, okay, I'm assuming you have a cookie saved on your computer, well, in your browser. Right. That um, makes you, you know, if you visit the website that you're already logged in. Um, yes. Or identify you as a user. And if you steal those cookies, um, other, yeah, well, you try to sell them so other people can use those cookies to log into your account even without knowing the password. So this is a problem too, because we have, we have AliExpress, Amazon, Walmart, whatever GearBeast is, uh, and then eBay. So like, these are all e-commerce things where you could just log into that person's account and start to make changes, start to make purchases. Of course, they probably have some safeguards against this if you're coming from a super strange IP address you've never joined before. Like, they, there might be some safeguards here. Or if you have two-factor, like, maybe that could help you before you make a purchase if it was to, like, demand that you authenticate. But, like, in a lot of cases, just having a cookie is enough to log you in and basically make this website think that you are that person. So there's a whole marketplace just in these cookies, apparently of which 30, 22% uh, were still valid on the day of discovery. That is a lot, which means that, you know, these if these cookies don't expire for a long time, that means that you could potentially use them to log into people's accounts and get even more data um, or do some very sketchy things like harvest credit card information or otherwise access things that you would need there credentials otherwise to get into. And this could also bypass 2FA in some instances, which is uh, pretty sketchy. Uh, we can see that there was a lot of credentials stolen from Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox, probably because these you know store credentials. Um, all in all, a pretty ridiculous breach. Like This is a lot of information. And the way that it can be used is very, very damaging, considering the amount of just credentials, cookies, and private files that were stolen from this. So uh, yeah. Um, Think twice before installing cracked versions of software, you guys. Uh, it definitely sucks to have all of your private files exfiltrated as well as your credentials and everything to this that now appears to be just be up and available for sale on the internet. So um, yeah, be careful. And also, you never know what malware is going to do. Sometimes it might just steal everything you do on the internet, plus all of your credentials, plus all of your accounts, plus all of your data and files, and just upload them to a big cache that anybody can buy access to. No fun at all. Crazy, scary. Yeah, and speaking um, of hackers stealing files and source code, um, what is uh, FIFA, Stefan? I feel like it's that's a football game. Well, a soccer game, as you would call it. Ah, a soccer game. That this makes sense. I was going to be like, I don't remember any football games called FIFA. Okay, all right. So unfortunately, some sort of European um, like ball game source code has been <laughs> stolen. And an EA breach, which must be this must be front page news in Europe, huh, Stefan? How are you? Um, how are you going to play your FIFA? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but FIFA is like really big here. I mean, like, like, I don't know. I I don't like football, soccer, whatever. But uh, this is like a huge uh, series. They make a ton of money with that. Yeah. So is this almost like I don't know, like Tony Hawk or something? Is it that big? Uh, it's they release a new version yearly okay and so it's very they sell like a lot of them it's wow. probably one of the best sellers of ea's games so this is nearly tony hawk in scale uh, can you compare this to tony hawk nothing Aren't there, like two you can't, tony hawk you can't compare and... anything to tony hawk <laughs> uh but sorry I, I just wanted to talk about him but yeah no this is uh this is definitely uh, I mean, we're seeing this a lot. Like, frankly, there's two different ways that you can deal. Then you can 
um, behave after you've gained access to a company's network. You can either steal stuff and try to sell it to somebody else, or you can take that stuff and try to sell it back to the company, either by threatening to leak it or by you know, ransomwareing it and then trying to get them to pay you for the key. So this is pretty typical behavior and we see lots of companies being hit with this sort of thing nowadays. I'm very sorry to all of you Europeans and your FIFA. Um, I hope that your FIFA recovers soon there's, and you're able to play more. it. Oh, really? Um, I think they also, they, they um, got access to a bunch of tools, but also the Frostbite engine, which is the uh, graphics engine used, for example, in Battlefield, or ah. the entire Battlefield series. Ah, that's, so, this affects um, Michael now, because he loves, you know, War of Tanks or whatever. Battlefield uh, of Tanks. That's, that's another company, but... Uh, <laughs> The, the, the point is, they probably they probably have access to a bunch of tools and also um, keys and and all that stuff to probably you know create a bunch of yeah hacks or, or cheat tools for games as well as maybe getting access to things inside the company uh, because the the whole breach contains uh, like tokens or something like that. Got it. Well, even worse, after being stolen, it seems like this poor data is now being flogged by hackers on a number of underground hacking uh, forums. So uh, not only did they take the data, it seems like they're torturing it too. That's uh, an unfortunate typo in this article and um, a, hilarious, a hilarious thing to think about. Um, all right, well, good reporting by, by Motherboard and Threat Post on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, if this is not the correct way... I, all right, all right, we're going to move on from this one. Uh, I, I, I can't bear to think about that poor data being flogged on all those forums any, any longer. Um, so, uh, looks like 3.3 million data uh, customers have been hit by a VW data breach, and these are specifically Audi customers, which is interesting because I forgot that Audi was owned by VW. Um, Dude, like, everything is owned by VW. Yeah, really? You guys are doing great, right? Uh, yes, monopolies, dude. So, no. Oh, right. But, yeah, technically. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is, specifically, this is people that were their customers or prospects. It looks like this was probably breached from their, like, marketing system. Um, and it looks like it's just, like, a combination of first names, last names, postal addresses, personal or business email addresses, and phone numbers. Again, this is contact information. This isn't like the worst breach on the world. This is not like the last breach we just talked about. This is not like, you know, they were hosting some file share for their uh, like customers or whatever, and that all their driving data has been breached or something. No, that is not what happened. Um, but attackers now know who basically all of their customers are. So if they wanted to be targeted for phishing attacks or other sort of attacks based on, you know, a, a bunch of phishing domains that look like Volkswagen or some sort of aftermarket, whatever, like you could very easily start to piece together information about potential uh, owners of these products. And maybe, um, I mean, if you think it's bad getting, you know, extended warranty calls now, just wait <laughs> until they know the exact, you know, own, like model of your car or whatever, and they want to get in touch with you about that. Um, so potentially very confusing for um, owners of these vehicles now to be contacted by someone who acts like they might be the, the manufacturer of your vehicle, but instead just saw your data in a data breach and wants to see if you're an idiot. So um, um, By the way, I, I read that if you were an actual customer and not just someone that's like, interested, um, but you bought a car, then your driver's license number, date of birth, and SSN, whatever that is, is also in that breach. An SSN is is uh, just this silly little number we Americans use to assign like oh, any sort of number. any okay. sort of government benefit to uh, to anybody who lives in our country. So yeah, that would be a bummer to have your SSN breached. That's a that's a big deal. Um, whoops. Oh, but guys, guess what? You guys get free identity theft protection. <laughs> you guys are so lucky. So, Stefan, let me explain this to you. Um, in the United States, when a company makes your life um, miserable by losing your data, that they've been also, they've usually been collecting this data without your permission and processing it in ways that you, you know, maybe consented to in the fine print, but weren't, weren't totally clear what they're using it for. So, they'll amass this mountain of data on you, lose it, make your life terrible, and then they'll be like, but guess what, buddy? We bought you free identity theft protection, and the company that's offering it is a subsidiary of us. So uh, after one year, the it's an automatic subscription. Don't worry about it, just a hundred bucks a year, and you know just don't cancel it, and it just rolls over. It's an easy subscription. We're basically getting you started, and everything is forgiven. It's like people are just like, wow, sweet. 
Um, but basically, they're giving you store credit because, like, most of the time, they either already have a contract with this company or, like, they are that company. So um, enjoy your uh, free identity theft protection. Right. By the way, this is a great example of why GDPR is good. Mm. Uh, because here, um, they would get a massive fine for a breach like that. And everyone that's, uh, whose information is leaked has... Um, uh, oh god, what's what's like, the word? Like legal recourse to do something about it? Yes, yes. Yeah, it, it just seems like, you know, you're just like, man, that sucks for you guys. You're probably going to get an identity theft happening to you. Here, here, take some identity theft monitoring. And it's just like, what, what, but what happens if I get identity theft? It's like, well, then you'll have to go through your bank. It's like, well, so you guys don't help at all. You just watch and then tell me when I get breached from this data breach that you did. Yes. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, like credit monitoring, credit monitoring, like, y thanks, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I don't know. So like, it, it's it's tricky because there's a lot of there's it's hard to know what to do in uh, a breach like this, and there are no legal reasons why you know you would go above and beyond this aside from maybe not, I don't know, hating your customers or making their lives more difficult. Um, you know, in the United States, in most states. So I would say, yeah, like it, it's not. In my opinion, solely my opinion, it's not really fair to have your data breached by a company that's been basically stalking you, uh, and then like have them be like, "Oh, we're so sorry about that. If you sign up with our our thing that actually makes us money on the back end, then like you know all is forgiven." It's not though. Um, so yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, unfortunately, this happens a lot. Um, whew. All right, so. Uh, Let's talk about Samsung devices. Um, and let's talk about just buying uh, an Android device in general. When you buy an Android device from someone who is not Google, it means the carrier gets a vote on the sorts of things that are included on these Android devices. So Stefan, have you ever had a, a non like Pixel Android device? Yes, I've had a phone that came with, um, let me think, I believe, Facebook and Instagram pre-installed and I was not able to uninstall it. <laughs> I was able to remove updates and basically disable it, like remove all the permissions, mm -hmm. but I was forbidden to delete the app. Yes. What the hell? Yeah, so uh, this is very, very common. When a carrier or a manufacturer or, or somebody who's making just like the software part or maybe the hardware of the phone gets a hold of Android, they can add all sorts of stuff to it and make it so that you don't get the regular version of Android, you get this other weird version of Android that they've tacked stuff onto. Now, some of this could be good, like support for features that your specific hardware alone offers. That's really cool. But in other cases, they just add unnecessary bloatware and management software and other things that you don't really want and didn't ask for. And if you knew what it did, probably wouldn't like. My favorite example is on the last smart uh, Samsung phone I will ever own, which was the Bixby button. Now, the Bixby button was a dedicated button which launched a half-baked personal assistant that would be pressed for virtually no reason and then crash frequently, as well as not being able to accomplish even basic requests or tasks. Now, that button was unable to be used for anything except this personal assistant, and there was nothing you could do to get rid of the personal assistant or make the button really do anything other than like maybe map to like the camera or something, but it would still just just trigger random things when being pressed in your pocket. Um, this is kind of a common example of how a, a carrier will take Android and then add something like the Bixby button as a feature and then make it impossible to remove. But while this ended my relationship with Samsung, a lot of people have persisted. And there are now some even more serious reasons why this carrier bloat could be an issue for people who value uh, I guess, control over the phone that they purchased. So some of these applications were found to be able to do things like editing the victim's contacts, that being like swapping out numbers, adding new contacts, deleting contacts, um, calls, SSS, SMS messages, and even worse, installing arbitrary apps. Um, and this is with device administrator rights. So that means that they can install things like monitoring apps, like all sorts of weird, creepy things that you do not want on your device. and 
that is if you don't like Samsung. The real problem with this is Samsung put that in there and then left it so insecure that basically anybody could abuse these features to use them as effectively exploits. So basically putting vulnerable applications on smartphones and then leaving them wide open to the point that other hackers could abuse them to do the sorts of things that I guess Samsung thought that only they could do, which again is still creepy because it's your phone, not Samsung's. So um, I'm not going to go completely through this whole article. If you're interested in it, check out uh, Oversecured and I'll also be retweeting it. But uh, yeah, um, some of these applications have very dangerous behaviors, which can be uh, triggered by somebody who is not authorized to be doing it. So even if you trust Samsung to be side loading applications onto your phone, reading your text messages or doing other stuff like that, then uh, the fact that another attacker could take advantage of these poorly secured apps to do the same thing is definitely, definitely alarming. Um, oh, and just to shout out, we found this out today. Uh, Wonder How To, the company that owns Nullbyte, both the website and the YouTube channel, is selling it. And we have no idea who to. They, I guess uh, they're still trying to figure it out too. So if you know a company that is trying to get into education and would benefit from having a giant audience and a giant library of written content, then uh, now's the time to do it because they're trying to sell that stuff. So again, I do not own this website. I uh, you know, maintain their YouTube channel or did until about a year ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you know anyone, I'm thinking, I don't know, somebody like Bug Crowd or Pentester Academy or anybody that like is really trying to get a large audience and make sure that free cybersecurity material is available to the community. This is a good opportunity, but unfortunately, you know, I don't have that kind of bread, so I'm not going to be buying it. Yeah, I wish we could just buy it. Yeah, that for real. Great. Yeah, or even just like the YouTube channel, frankly, like is, uh, you know. Yeah. You know, but. Um, again, so if you're if you know someone that's interested in maintaining these resources or even continuing to put out new resources, it's great to be able to keep, get in front of seven hundred thousand um, people that are interested in cybersecurity on YouTube. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I would love to see this project continue uh, because uh, I don't really know what the future of Nullbyte is at this point, and that makes me kind of sad. All right. Uh, next up, I really like this project. Um, Stefan, were Amazon DoorDash buttons ever a thing in Germany? I think they are, yeah. Well, DoorDash, wait, isn't there like Ring or something? Isn't that owned by Amazon too? Well, so these Dash Amazon Dash buttons are not DoorDash. Oh. Yeah, they're they're yes. specifically for just like whacking a button and then like you get like an order of something. So I don't know anyone that uses those, but uh, they were heavily, I think they still are heavily advertised on the German Amazon page. Yeah, uh, well, they're no longer supported. Um, they're gonna, <laughs> they, yeah, they're gonna discontinue them. And wow, uh, but a lot of people are using them for IoT applications, so they're using them to be able to like do all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, Amazon has decided to do the responsible thing and uh, brick them and basically make Ugh. this thing that you purchased totally useless to you, rather than like opening them up for anybody else to do anything with them. So if you want to preserve these buttons, um, then you need to do it in a way that where they're not going to be able to phone home because very soon they are going to be bricked and will deliberately be destroyed in a way that will make them unusable. So uh, what I thought was really cool is there's literally like a tone you can play to them that will um, trigger an exploit and allow you to prevent a them tone. from updating. Yes, literally a, a wave file tone. Um, and that is enough because they use like an odd like an audio exchange of data in order to set up. So like there are there are some, uh, for example, like smart devices now that will require you to play an audio file, which will is just like a translated version of some information. Um, usually it's it's just enough to set up like a connection between the two devices and then they exchange data. So in this case, I guess there's like a buffer overflow or like something. I don't I don't totally remember how this works, um, but. Uh, if you have a supported version, then this audio file will actually cause the device to be exploited and allow you to, um, yeah, like make it so that it's not going to get bricked. So I thought this was just cool because like how often is the, is the exploit like an audio file? But in this case it is. So, uh, uh, yes, you can see this, uh, <laughs> you can see this Crazy. test rig of them doing it, but 
Um, yeah, I love audio exploits. I think that's cool. And now that I see more IoT devices using audio to transfer data, like sometimes I'll see a, um, like a camera or something that will require you to hold up a QR code and it will optically scan and decode the QR code to, to figure out whatever, whatever information it needs to connect to the Wi-Fi network. But I've also seen ones that just make like a weird loud chirping sound and just listen on the microphone um, and decode it as part of the setup. So interesting to see these buttons were doing that and that there's a way to basically break them uh, so that they, yeah, Honestly, continue to work. I think it's kind of creepy that the button has a microphone. Right? <laughs> I, yeah, I know. I, I, yeah, I, was, I was going through my YouTube comments recently and there were a lot of people on my video I made about hacking smart lights that are trying to like defend themselves, like argue with me about how their smart lights are actually secure or something. Like if I was interested in arguing with them, I just make my point in the video. And, uh, but I think like a story like this makes a great point for me because um, you might not uh, be aware that, for example, the lamp you're using could not just be um, a hack to turn your light on and off but you know, listen into your conversations, mm. possibly. Yeah, because I'm it has not aware stuff of you're not that... using. Yeah, like you don't. That's the thing. You you buy IoT devices and you don't really know what they do, what's inside of the, the hardware. You don't have no control over the software. And then a few years later, they are discontinued, mm -hmm. and you have a piece of trash because the uh, manufacturer, like Amazon, is bricking them on purpose. That's just super wasteful and ugh, awful. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not very surprised. It's very common for these big manufacturers to then to push a product really hard and then just discontinue it. Um, startups also do this pretty often, but big manufacturers doing it is is really nothing new. Uh, it just kind of sucks that you have to actively exploit them in order to prevent them from being bricked at this point. If you wanted to do something with them later, yeah, that's the only cool thing. Um, exploiting them, like hacking <laughs> them, is that's like super fun. But most people don't do that, so um, yeah, this is not true. that great. Okay, so this was a very interesting story that has to do with code and the law. Uh, in the United States, um, it is increasingly uh, felt as something that needs to happen that these, sta these states need to pass some sort of law against 3D printed weapons. And usually these laws have to do with if you 3D print a weapon and assemble it, you have committed a crime. Delaware has decided to go back a little bit and is like, okay, if you go on the internet and access a file, a text file. Maybe you go on GitHub and access it. Maybe you download it. Maybe somebody gives you a flash drive that has it on it. It doesn't really matter. If you just access this text-based file, then you have committed a felony. Um, this is pretty unusual because aside from very specific cases of like something like where a minor is being harmed or something, there's not a lot of pieces of code or pieces of text or, or, or a file that will get you in immediate trouble for merely viewing or possessing it. So um, Delaware going through the trouble of making it an actual crime to have or have accessed the description of shapes which could become through several actions of firearm is very, very alarming for people who view code as free speech. Because at what point do these shapes become a felony? If you have two separate files that could be combined to make something, is that also a felony? Like the, the legal standard here is very confusing because at least in our country, um, the Supreme Court has constantly found that code is free speech and has uh, shown that trying to prohibit somebody from possessing a piece of code or writing a piece of code is often very difficult, provided the code is not you know, a virus that's uh, going out and attacking very directly uh, someone's system. So this is just a new legal precedent that's being set in the United States that a lot of people are probably going to have to be, um, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, have their opinions expressed about because Again, code has traditionally been seen as free speech and charging somebody with a felony for merely accessing, you know, a description of an object effectively is a radical shift in the way that uh, people have been going after, for example, 3D printed weapons or other 3D printed things that they don't like. So we've heard all sorts of really crazy ways of trying to crack down on this, like regulating 3D printers, trying to make it so uh, it's harder to print certain files on 3D printers. Like it's it's really a difficult conversation to have, but um, a lot of people are kind of confused by uh, this particular state in the United States going the extra step of making merely accessing a text-based description of shapes a felony. 
just as though you'd actually constructed the thing and were possessing a fully constructed, fully, you know, whatever actual uh, device. So, I mean, you know, some people uh, are interested in this sort of thing just uh, from a purely research perspective and, you know, not being able to even look at the description of one of these and see what it looks like is a pretty heavy handed approach. And uh, I don't know, kind of freaks me out. Like it's weird to know that at least in this state, you could be labeled as a felon just by opening a particular file um, that you have no intention or, or maybe you don't even have a 3D printer this would still be a crime to access that file like on GitHub or anywhere else on the internet. So I don't know, Stefan, if there's any, if you have any equivalent laws in your country, but I don't know of a lot of other, uh, a lot of other states that have laws that make it a crime merely to access a file referencing an illegal object or something like that. No, I, do you think this would hold up, you know, if there's an actual case? This is a, like, I, I have a lot of criticism for people who don't understand the internet yet make laws about the internet. I think that anybody who makes a, a law um, out making it a felony to possess a text file like may not understand like the Streisand effect and like some of the other things that the internet has really caused when it comes to trying to remove something that uh, you don't like but is you know either legal in most of the world or freely and easily accessible via like a text file on the internet. That's really the problem here. I think like, you know, merely accessing a website which could contain this information, does that constitute, you know, the same thing? Like how do you prove a user accessed a particular text file? Did they download it? Which part of like we just don't really know here what the line is until somebody gets arrested for this, really. And um, you know, like I no, to answer your question, I don't think that that making a law that says you can't you can't look at a description of an object that is illegal like or you know if you happen to create an object that could be printed out and turned into a firearm how much effort would be required before that's considered to be a firearm is it like an hour's worth of effort taking this 3d printed shape and turning it into a weapon like i could go on and on and on about the the ways that this is difficult to enforce and confusing um but the felony part is really what's scary. Like there, there's a lot of people who might be curious about this who now absolutely cannot access or download this file or even look at it again, even if they don't have a 3D printer for fear that they might be charged with a felony. So spooky and weird, the, the realm of 3D printing and law, especially when we have people who arguably maybe don't understand the internet that well, trying to put very, very serious charges behind something as simple as accessing a text file. Like kind of freaks me out. Um, and I think that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. The last thing I wanted to mention was uh, distributed denial of secrets has been in the news a lot lately for leaks and other sorts of things that uh, involve company breaches. And Twitter has constantly gone after the activists behind this as well as their primary account. And it looks like distributed denials of secret has been taken down again for violating the Twitter rules on ban evasion. So this is probably going to continue repeatedly. Twitter is really not that much of a public square for anybody who does something that makes a major company angry. And distributed denial of secrets has definitely made a number of uh, companies and politicians angry. So um, arguably Twitter is not a very safe space for, this, uh, for these people anymore because uh, they keep getting their accounts taken down when they're trying to do their thing. So again, this sort of activism, this sort of hacktivism, I guess, is much more common nowadays with increasingly belligerent companies uh, hoarding data and then poorly securing it. These activists typically are the ones to go in, show the data was being collected in creepy ways and then leak it if it's not being securely, uh, <laughs> securely um, secured, I guess. So uh, yeah, that's uh, probably not gonna help banning them from Twitter. Uh, but, you know, it, it just another one of the things you see with hacktivists online. Um, they tend to get their accounts taken down repeatedly, and uh, all you really need to do is just Google them in order to find their latest account or their latest website. But it, it's interesting to see who gets their accounts taken down on Twitter. And in this case, hacktivists have definitely been a target of account takedowns lately. So. All right, that's all we got for the show today. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Stefan, also thank you for ta letting us see a little sneak peek of some of these projects that are still under development. It's great to give the community a chance to uh, give you some feedback on it, maybe su suggest some future features, and also just see what we're thinking about for you know the next year of hacking and hacking related devices. Yeah, I th there's a lot coming. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll, yeah, and, and if we have something, we'll make a, Maybe we make a separate live stream for it too. 
So yeah, that would be great. Subscribe. <laughs> Yeah, as soon as we um, as soon as we get everything to the point where we have like a physical prototype in hand, we'll definitely do a stream on it just so you guys can see, you know, what we've come up with and how you might use it. I've always loved the Dauther Watch because it allows you to use uh, like a D1 Mini as a Wi-Fi auditing tool without anything else, without connecting to it via a phone, a smart uh, like a computer, via serial cable or Wi-Fi. You can just get started with it immediately, and that's exactly what this new tool does. So it's a really easy way for you to get basically the same benefit of the Dauther watch without actually needing to buy a Dauther watch because big surprise Stefan doesn't make that much when you do but this project will help support the community and also is available for cheap to anyone who wants to make it themselves so yeah very very cool and looking forward to that project uh being finished in the near future so I'll also mention uh, I think Stefan and I are still going to be doing a talk at Black Hat although I'll bet virtually so uh, if you want to see more of us, also check that out because uh, Veronis is sponsoring us to do a, a cool talk on, among other things, the Andromeda Dauther and how we can use it to uh, break into a Wi-Fi network. So it's going to be really cool. All right, everyone, we will see you next time. Make sure to check out the Security Forward channel as well as the Veronis brand channel where you can check out Killian doing the threat update every week. And we hope to see you next time on our Tuesday and Friday show. All right, have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye.